Uh, we're carrying on with a series we began last summer. It's called The Way. We started talking about probably the greatest sermon that's ever been preached by the greatest preacher who's ever lived. His name is Jesus. And uh, it is in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7 make up that teaching. Last year, uh, last summer, we walked through the 10 weeks in chapter 5. This summer, beginning now for the next 10 weeks, we're going to walk through chapter 6. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, we just went like 12 weeks through the book of Joshua and we covered a chapter a week. Yes, we did, but we're going to slow this thing down a little bit and we're going to cover uh, just chapter 6 uh, for the summer. Uh, we're continuing in this series called The Way. Jesus uh, began this teaching, chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, I hope you do. We're going to read the passage in a minute. But if you've got your Bibles, look at chapter 5. Chapter 5 kind of opens up by letting us see where uh, Jesus said that he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. Crowds would follow Jesus everywhere. They would bring their sick. They would bring uh, all their needs, their, even those who were possessed. And Jesus and his disciples, Jesus would, would, he would minister in all kinds of ways, healings and teachings and uh, casting out those demons. And it says that he sat down. And when he sat down, he began to teach them about the way of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And as he was teaching them, things would begin to happen. I mean, they, I mean, he began to, in fact, in chapter five, what he did is he elevated what it means to live as a follower of Jesus, a follower of the way, a follower of God. He was contrasting the way, the reason that he came versus what the religious of the elite, the religious elites, the Pharisees were doing. He was drawing a contrast between his teaching and their teaching. Chapter 5, when you read through that, you begin to see where he says in there, you have heard it said, but I tell you, okay? He is redefining and he is raising, this is what holiness looks like. This is what my children, this is what the new kingdom, if you're going to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, this is what it's supposed to look like. And this is what it is that he's trying to give them. He's already told them, listen, you're being called in chapter five. He's telling them, listen, you've been called to be salt and you've been called to be light. This is the direction that we're gonna begin to see because he raised it and elevated it. And now he's gonna show us in chapter six. And I wanna be real careful here. Jesus didn't write in, or the, uh, he didn't like speak this in chapter five, verse one. He's just preaching. So we're just picking up in the sermon flow. He's, this is where he's been, and now this is what we're about to see when he starts to talk to us about the way. And I'm excited about this because for the next three weeks, he's going to be talking about the way of the heart. We're going to be able to see the heart and the motivation behind why we do what we do and the heart behind why we worship. And today, we're going to be talking about the way of the heart in giving. Now, some of you may be going, okay, what, what, hold on. Are we talking about finances? Well, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things today because giving is more than money, right? More than money. And we're going to be seeing what is our heart behind what Jesus has called us to. So with that, we're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And as we do, I want to invite you, would you please stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God? If you got your Bibles, open up there, turn them on, whatever you got to do. You can see them on the screen if you don't. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus is speaking and he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse 3, but when you give to the needy, do not let your, right, your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That's the reading of God's Word. You can be seated. Uh, listen, uh, growing up... Uh, 
I was a, a little boy who, um, I, was, I was bigger than everybody else. I, I wasn't necessarily chubby boy, but I was tall boy. Uh, I hit growth spurts real early in life. So all the way through uh, up to like ninth grade, I was bigger than everybody else. And then at ninth grade, everyone caught me and passed me, and I became a little twerp at that point. <laughs> uh, as a little boy in my hometown, I was in a small town where you could, you know, there was no worries about being able to go out, ride your bike. Uh, I was a BMXer. Okay, guys, yes, we did have BMX back then. We did have that. That was there. And so I, I had a BMX bike, loved to ride around town. That's back when you could let your kids go ride around town and there'd be no issues. My mom would go to work. I'd get on my bike and I would go. Uh, I was the guy in the neighborhood being the bigger guy. All, I was kind of the ringleader. So all the guys, we would go to their house. Hey, come on out. Let's go. We're going to do this. It's almost like Sandlot. Y'all watch Sandlot? Is that, that kind of deal. We all wrangle up, and it was like, I, I kind of would just say, hey, here's what we're going to go do today. Well, at our house where I lived, we had back another street, there was an old warehouse that had been demolished, and that old warehouse, it was just a huge slab concrete foundation was all that was left. And because it was in a, uh, it was a, a warehouse, it was multiple levels of foundation. Well, listen, uh, as, a, as a little boy, uh, you know, kind of ring leading, enjoying BMX, riding the bikes. You know what we would do. We're jumping everything. We're trying to figure out how to jump off things. Like we'd go and ride and whew, we'd jump off this ledge here. You know, we'd ride to the next one. Where, where the receiving ramp was, that we'd run, ride, ride your bike up. It was incredible. We'd do that for hours and hours. Now, listen, I, I, though I was a bigger kid, kind of a ringleader, I, I wasn't all... Uh, I wasn't really the smartest kid, all right? Uh, Y'all have heard of STEM? Uh, listen, I was not a STEM kid, all right? We, did have, we didn't even have a T back then, technology. It was just seam, really, you know? <laughs> Science, engineering, art, and math, all right? And I wasn't good at any of those things. Uh, I was the type of kid that just, uh, you know, wanted to have a good time, ride my bike, enjoy things. I got the great idea it was one of those, hey, watch this, guys, <laughs> ideas. Uh, listen, I've jumped off this thing enough. What if we built a ramp and then we could come up and launch? Let's try that. Well, I told you I was not one of the smarter kids, so we built this ramp, and I didn't really realize that the higher the incline, the longer the run has to be to go up that incline, if you know what I'm saying. I see some head shaking. You got what I'm going it was too late, though. I was already in the middle of it. You know, I've got, I'm at the back of that building, and I'm going crazy. But you, guys, you remember, you're like, <laughs> I mean, you're killing it down there. And about 10 feet from where the incline is, I realize this is wrong. This isn't going to work. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go up this thing. But it was too late. I hit that ramp. That board splintered. I hit the concrete. I went over. And on top of that, I like didn't have my shirt on because I was going to be somebody big. <laughs> All the guys know what this is about. All the women are shaking their head going, because either they have seen this with their own little boys or, you know, handlebars break, broke my BMX, strawberry down my chest. It was... You know, but I got up trying to be cool because I, I learned at that very moment, literally at that very moment, it doesn't pay for me to go, hey, watch this. <laughs> you know, that was kind of where I stopped trying to draw attention to myself. This is a little bit about what the Lord's trying to say here, because what he is doing is he is drawing out for us three things, three things that I want you to see. Hopefully, I want you to write these down. We're going to engage with this. Three things that he's going to show us in this short four verses is this, is that he's going to present for us a warning of worship. He's going to pre present for us a warning of worship. And then from there, he's going to bring us to the way of the world. He's going to say, listen, here's the warning, and then he's going to illustrate with the way of the world. And then he's going to wrap this thing up, I think, and we're going to be able to see with the way of Jesus. What does the way look like? The way of Jesus in here. 
You see, these people that he's preaching to on the mountain, all of them who had come, the end of chapter seven says when he's finished teaching, they look at him and they go, he doesn't teach like everyone else. This is a man who has authority. He's telling them here, he says, listen, you're gonna have a tension because remember, Jesus was the agent of creation. He's the one that created us. He's the one that created them. He knew them intricately. He knew them that, listen, the fall had happened. Sin had entered in. They were broken individuals. And he knew that they and us would always be striving for attention, that we would always be what Paul David Tripp calls glory thieves, trying to seek for ourselves what only the Lord deserves and is rightly his. And he says, listen, this is going to be an issue for you. Notice what he says in verse one. I want to go back through here. Verse one, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. He's continuing in this chapter five sermon. He moves on and he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before others. Now the word for righteousness here is right standing. Some of you, your, your Bibles may even translate this as good works. Good works that reveal that our lives belong to the father. Listen, uh, we don't do any work. I want to be really, really clear here. We do no work to earn our standing before the Father. That work was done by Jesus Christ on the cross. It was his work alone. His work on our behalf sealed our salvation. When he calls us, he awakens us, and we respond to him. That's the work. But once we are, our, our eyes are open, we've surrendered our lives to him, you know what we're called to do? have good works, not for salvation, but as a product of our salvation. So he says to them here, he continues on. And just so that you guys have a picture of what good works is, in the Jewish system of this day, their good works, their spiritual disciplines, you you hear us talk about spiritual disciplines here, right? Uh, Bible study, prayer, Uh, journaling, meditation, acts of silence, giving, worshiping together. Do you know what the main spiritual disciplines, the main aspects of good works of righteousness for the Jewish people of that day was going to the synagogue, being in the synagogue, giving, prayer, and fasting. You see, all of life for the Jewish people revolved around the temple, the synagogue, if you lived in Jerusalem, it was the temple. If you lived in the, uh, away from Jerusalem, it was the synagogue. That's where you would go. You would hear the reading of the scripture. You would pray. You would bring uh, alms. You would give alms. In fact, this is what this whole passage here is really talking about. It's talking about giving of alms, giving, uh, giving to the needy. He says, listen, when, when you go... When you're out, when you're at the temple, when you're around in your communities, beware, beware of your good works, practicing your righteousness before men. Now, notice this. He's not condemning us doing works of righteousness here. Because if he did, that would contradict what he said in chapter 5. Remember in chapter 5, he says, listen, we're to be salt of the earth. We're to, our lives should be salty. They should be infected with God so that when you walk into wherever it is that you're walking into, people would taste your life, the, your way of living, and they would go, there's something different there. That's a public aspect. He says in chapter 5, verses 14, 15, 16, he says, listen, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. I think that's King James Version. No one puts it under a basket. They set it on a stand so it may be be seen. Why should it be seen? So that people would praise your father in heaven. See, these are public. He says, but you need to beware. You need to beware here. Folks, here's what I want us to catch real quick. When we're practicing good works, when we are practicing our acts of righteousness, that are things that identify us with the Father, when we're doing that so that the eyes of men see us, I need you to hear, we've just missed the heart of God. Did you hear what I said? 
when we do things so that George will see me, I've just missed the heart of God. And, and I want us to camp here for just a moment because ultimately what this whole passage, and I want you to hear the next three weeks are going to reveal to us, and I'm asking the Holy Spirit that we sung about and we asked to come today to reveal to us what is the motivation and the heart behind why we do what we do? You know, the longer we walk with Jesus, the longer that you have been with him, the more you allow the word of God to become a part of you. The deeds of the flesh, those things that like are outwardly that would look sinful, they should begin to fall away, right? And then what we begin to find is that it is the motivations of our heart. Why do we do what we do? Why, do we, why would we want to go do things that would be embarrassing to the name of Christ? You see, the motivation, your heart level is where life is lived. Out of the heart, what does man do? He speaks and acts. And so what Jesus is getting at here, and, and this is what began to rankle, upset, drive a wedge, is that he's saying, if you're going to follow the way of the kingdom, then it's going to look very different than the religious elites. It's going to look different than the, the Pharisees who do everything so that they might be seen. Their whole life is to be seen living out a certain way so that you'll look at them and go, oh, look at them. Good job. Look at them. Boy, they're holy. They're righteous. And he says, this is not the way of the kingdom. You see, he's calling us to live. Listen, you've got to do works of righteousness. Uh, uh, that's what we're called to do. Worship and serve and give to to walk, pray, to walk alongside, studying the word. You see, he's not saying that we shouldn't do these works. No, we should be doing them. In fact, we ought to even be doing them publicly. R.C. Sproul, uh, pastor, theologian, he's gone on to be with the Lord now in one of his books called Knowing Scripture. He says this, he, he says this, he says, here then is the real problem in our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it's dull and boring, but because it's work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. Ouch, that hits me. <laughs> I mean, that, that hits me. Folks, let me ask you a question. How active are you in walking out your acts of righteousness? Or is it, man, I, I really don't want to get up tomorrow. I don't want to go serve VBS. I don't want to go and serve in kids ministry, preschool ministry. I, you know what? The money that's in my back pocket is my back pocket, and it's my money. The, somebody needs a place to stay. It's my house. I don't really want anybody there. Folks, we're called to do acts of righteousness, good works. We're called to do those. In fact, he even says that when we do them and we do them in the right motivation in the right way, our father will see us and he will reward us. You realize it's not wrong to, I want rewards. I want them for the right reason though, because of the glory of God. Some of us in here today, though, we, we're just lazy, to be honest with you. That may mean you have to get up a little bit earlier so that you can get in the Word. It may mean that, whoa, I mean, I've got to cut some things out so I can serve. It may mean that I can't do this thing over here because this brother or sister needs something over here, and I can meet that need, which means I have to forego this thing, this want, so I can meet this need. You see, Jesus is saying to us, no, listen, you need to practice your righteousness. In fact, we should even practice our right. He's not condemning practicing your righteousness out in front of people. I really, I want you to hear this. I really believe that if what we say we believe in here, we lived out there, our world would be different. That's where amen should come in. <laughs> if what we truly say we believe in here, we lived out there. Rutherford County would be different. 
it would be. You see, he's not saying don't practice works of righteousness. He's not even saying don't do them publicly. What he's condemning here, what he is calling out is that we do them publicly so that Zion looks at me and goes, that's a boy right there. Yeah, you go, Kyle. You're doing them so that someone else will see and you'll get the attaboy from them rather than well done, my good and faithful servant. He says, when you do that, you need to know you've already gotten your reward. It's, it's over. It's done. True confessions. I don't know if you guys ever um, have struggles with that. You know, anyone who stands up here and gives leadership in any way has to fight against making sure that when you say, well done, we did good, that that doesn't terminate on us. We have to fight that. You have to fight, you have to fight that when you do something for someone else, you're not doing it so that they will think highly of you. See, it's, it's they have to think highly of your father. You know, I have to make sure that when I prepare a message and I'm reading the word and, and it's a tough word, and I'm doing this, I, I, I've got to preach this. But I get up here and I look out and I know your story because you've shared your story. And I have to go, oh, this story, what the word is saying here is going to hit you. And I have a point right there where I have to go, do I read the word and teach the word or do I back off because I don't want them to be upset? Folks, we all deal with this. Every one of us deal with this. Why do we do what we do? You see, the heart matters. Why did I post that picture? Why did I serve that person? Why did I serve that person and make sure I got a picture of it so I could <laughs> post it? Why, why? Is that for me, the Lord? What, what, what is that? You see, we have to get down deeper than I didn't cuss you got to get down deeper and go, what is the motivation of my heart today? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why did I come to church this morning? Is it because I just want to be seen by somebody? Why is it that I'm serving down here? Because I really like Austin. I want Austin to like me. I'm doing it for Austin. We wouldn't say we're doing it for Austin, but we may be. We, it may be that I'm serving or I'm doing because, well, nobody else is going to do it, so I guess that means i got to do it. Listen, at that point, it terminates on us. What is the motivation behind why we do what we do? And this is what Jesus says. He's warning us. He says, listen, if you're not careful, if you don't examine here, you're going to end up doing what all of them are doing. And they're whitewashed tombs. And he begins, it's at this point right here, this message, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. It's at this point that the Pharisees begin to go, we got to get him off the scene. We got to kill him. We don't, we don't need him around. Some of you in here right now, you may be thinking, so does this mean that we can't congratulate each other and say, hey, good job, you did well? No, 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 no. Listen, we all need encouragement. Listen, I love it when people come back and go, man, that was a good message. Thank you so much. I'm, and and what, I, what I have to try, what I have to do then is I receive it and get in the car and go, Father, that was for you. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. Uh, somebody said a little while ago, it's like, you older folks, you'll remember this. It's like, it's like chiclets. You just take them, you chew them up, you spit them out after you chewed them on a couple of times because it's, it's gone. Listen, you receive, but then you have to turn that back to the Father because ultimately this is for Him. It's for Him. God, thank you. Thank you. So that he's warning us about our motivation. Look at the second thing, though, that he says there. The second thing that he wants you to begin to see is the way of the world. You see, he has given us a warning, and now he's going to present the picture with the Pharisees. Verse 2 says this. He says, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogue and in the streets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Jesus has said, listen, you go ahead and you practice your acts of righteousness. And now what he's going to do is he's going to drill down. He's going to get a down deep 
about one of those practices, one of those spiritual disciplines. And he talks about giving to the needy. This term giving of the needy is really a term. And in fact, some of your Bibles may have it translated as almsgiving. Almsgiving in the Jewish context was specifically having to do with the giving money so that people who were poor, they were needy, they were indigent, they had benevolence situations so that that could be met. Uh, Extra biblical, I want to make sure that you hear this, this is extra biblical history, tells us that uh, in the Jewish temple and in the synagogues, offerings where you would give those alms, there was a, a treasury, and the top of that treasury, how you put it in, was a trumpet, a shofar. Do you know what a shofar is? A ram's horn. Those horns many times are curved, circular. They might be made out of brass. They might be made out of copper or bronze. And people would come in because their money was in coins, especially if you were rich. You might make sure that you took a coin or two that you threw into that trumpet, and what would it do? Hit every side all the way down. Everybody's looking. If you were really rich, you'd just take them all and just toss them in there, and it'd make a racket. Some, in these festival times, there would be people literally blowing trumpets, announcing. History tells us that there were even in that day people who would give large sums of money so that their name could be on the road or a plaque. I did this. You know, I remember being in a church previously, and I was always, not this church, I was always thankful for people who wanted to make sure that everybody needed what they needed and that there were things in the church. And I remember in one of my very first churches, everywhere I went, there was a plaque that said, in honor of, and gave a name. In honor of, and a name. In honor of, and gave a name. Or given by, given by, given by. Folks, this is one of those things here where the Lord says, you, you don't want your right hand and your left hand knowing. This isn't about you. This isn't about them. This is about us releasing what it is that the Lord has given to us. Because when that happens, your reward has been met right there. You see, Jesus is preaching right here, and he is saying to us, listen, we should be giving. He is calling us to give. He doesn't say if you give, he says, when you give. Folks, I am very, very, I, I ask you all the time, hey, don't forget, you make sure you be faithful with your tithes and offerings, you give your money, you, uh, it'll, and you are generous. Oh, my word, you're generous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We, we get to do the things that we do here because of uh, us giving our money back to the Lord and ministry happening. Do you realize that we, because of that, we are able to meet uh, needs when people have a, like literally a physical need. I don't, uh, we have people who come in who need food baskets. We have people who can't pay light bills. We have people in the body who need, they're in desperate situations and the church can come together I had somebody on the way in uh, stop and tell me uh, they have a situation in their life where they've been doing some fostering, and they said, if it were not for the body, each and every week just bringing me things, I don't know what we would do. This is what the body does. I do nothing of that. You know what that means? Right hand and left hand, not knowing anything. <laughs> we're just serving, serving and serving. Here's what, when, when, when you're trying to make sure that someone knows what you're doing, not only is it I'm for the eyes of man, really it's like a bribe. Uh, Sin, Sinclair Ferguson writes this. He says, uh, describing Jesus' teaching, he says, this type of giving, this is not a gift in the sight of God. It's a purchase. The man is not helping the poor half as much as the man is using the poor to help himself. Folks, some of you right now may be thinking, dude, he is coming at me. He is like, no, 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 listen. What, what's happening right here, 
What's happening right here is I want the motivation of our heart as followers of Christ, those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus, who have surrendered our lives to him, I, what I want is for us to do what we do for his glory alone. I'm not looking. I, I love it. And I want you to encourage me with that, boys, and good jobs. But ultimately, one day, what I truly want to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. That is what we strive for. And, if, and that means that we have to fight the fight of that person and me wanting to impress that person, you wanting to be seen by that person, you doing what you do so that someone else will think more highly of you. You see, because when we do that, we're following the way of the world. We in and of ourselves have become the very thing that, and the very person that Jesus said, that's not the way of the kingdom. That's not how this should be at all. And Jesus introduces a word here that was not a word. It's not a biblical word. It's a, it's a word from the theater. He, said, he, he talks about these hypocrites. And literally, literally what that means is in the theater world, when there would be acting in the Greek world, when there would be acting, uh, they wouldn't depend on facial expressions. They would grab masks that were over-exaggerations. It might be a mask that had like a huge smile on it, uh, raised eyes, big eyes, huge smile, a, a sad face a perplexed face, and they would grab that mask and they would use it, not meaning that they were sad. They were allowing the mask to do the communication. And folks, do you realize that when we put on the mask of this is all for God, but really I want you to see it, and I'm living for your praise, not for the glory and honor of God. We, we become hypocrites. And I need you to know this. We all struggle with this. <laughs> Everyone in here, we all struggle with this. You know why? Because ultimately it's an issue of the heart. And no one sees the heart but you and me. I see my heart and God sees my heart. You see your heart and God sees your heart. Nobody else sees that. Over long periods of time, though, it begins to be borne out and other people begin to see it. And what Jesus is calling us to here, what he's calling us to is not the way of the rest of the world. He's calling us to kingdom living. If we're going to be citizens of this new land, if we're going to say that we are followers and surrenders to him, then he's called us to be very, very careful how we live our lives. Because you can live for the applause of man or you can live for the applause of God, but you can't do both. You understand that, right? I want to make sure I'm really clear here. You can't live for the applause of man and the applause of God or the approval of God. It, it, those things are, at some point, those things are going to rub up against each other. Usually that it's with each action. <laughs> and you, me, why are we doing what we're doing? So he's given us a warning. He showed us the way of the world. Now he's going to show us his way, the way of Jesus, the way of the kingdom. Look at verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4 says this, but when you give to the needy, notice that he says when you give, not if you give. I want to draw that right there. Normative Christian life is that we are generous people. We are givers, not just of our finances, but of our possessions, of our time. That is normative Christianity. It, I don't understand how when Jesus gave everything, laid his life down, we would think, I have to give nothing to this. It, if that were in a human relationship, there would be divorce quickly. You understand that, right? Thus I digress. Let me go back here. <laughs> but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
The New Testament life is clear. The New Testament life is clear, is that we are giving people that we give the best of our money, we give the best of our time, we give the best of our day, we give the best of our effort. For some of you right now, that may mean, yeah, I need to start being more generous with my money. For some of you, that may mean I need to start, you're generous with your money, but we need your time also. I served a church in Houston, Texas, and it was a very affluent church. I did something there that I thought I'd never do. I had to stand one day and say to the church, I don't need any more of your money, I need you. Your money, I've got to have you. I, folks, we need to give the best of our money. We need to give the best of our time. We need to give the best of our efforts because we don't work as unto each other. We work as unto God. For some of you in here, you're in a sorry job. And the reason it's a sorry job is because you've got a sorry boss, just to be honest with you. But I need you to know, I have to be reminded at points in those times that I don't work for this person, I work for this God. And I work as unto him. And when I work as unto him, I let my light shine, I become the salt of the earth, my light is put on a, on a pedestal. And you know what your workers around you begin to do? Why do you do this when he or she does that? Because I don't work for him, I work for the Lord. That's kingdom living. And worship is all of life. Worship isn't just what we do here. Worship is how we live out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We present our bodies as living sacrifices. That is our worship that is holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. You see, he's calling us to the way of Jesus, something that is radically different than the way the rest of the world looks something that looks completely different. You see, he is concerned about the gift. He is concerned about the, the prayer, the singing, the leading, the serving. He is concerned about that. But I need you to know he's more concerned about the motivation behind what you're doing than anything else. This is why, uh, this is why in the Old Testament, the prophets would say, it's not the, the, the blood of bulls and goats and lambs that I'm desiring. It's not your sacrifice. It's your heart that I'm looking after. That's what I want. Where, I want us to have a heart that seeks only after God. I realize that's difficult. So that when we are doing something that's not seeking after the heart of God, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will come and he will speak to you and he'll convict you. He'll convict me and he will turn me back and say, God, I'm so sorry. Because of what you did, I now, I return to you. I know there's been broken fellowship and thank God there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And today you may be sitting in here and you're going, man, I feel like I'm bitten beat up. That's not the intent. But I'm also not going to let, I'm not going to like pull anything off the Holy Spirit may be saying to you. But know that there's no condemnation. This is the Spirit drawing you and saying, come home, come home, come home, come home. You know, it's tiring to keep up a mask. It's tiring to work for someone else's approval and love. You who are weary, come home. You don't have to do it anymore. Uh, if you have children or you've been a child, do you remember, those of you who are old enough and you have older kids and you remember when they were younger, or maybe you've got the younger kids, maybe you were the younger kid, at the baseball field, at the soccer field, at the dance recital, at the play, whatever it is, the kid, the child, your child, would do something, and when they would do something good, here's what they do, they find you. They're looking for you. They may have hit the ball and got thrown out, but they made first base and they look in the stands, where's dad? Just smile. Maybe, maybe it was you're teaching them how to ride the bike and they've gotten over the, the wobblies and they're riding and all of a sudden you just hear, look, mom, look, look, mom, look, look, dad, look, 
All they want is for you to see them. You remember that? I can get a little misty thinking about it. Do you know that's what we should be living our lives like? Not, look, Amy, Amy, look at me. Peyton, Evan, y'all look at me. Jordan, look at me. Now, you know how we live our lives? Father, look at me. I'm looking at you. What do you, what do you want? Can you imagine what our life would be like? Can you imagine what your life and this community would be if we took our eyes off of here and we put our eyes here? And when we do put our eyes here, uh, we're asking the Spirit, reveal to me so we can get my eyes back here. This isn't about being perfect. This is about being Spirit-led, Spirit-sensitive. Father, I want to live for you. Some of you in here today, the Spirit's not alive in you. Because you've never submitted your life to him. And I, I want to make sure that you're clear. I said this earlier. We don't work for anything around here. That work's already been done by Jesus. What we do is we come and we surrender and we submit and we get under it. We trust you, Jesus. That's what we're calling you home to. He wants to redeem you. He wants to change you. He wants to take out your heart of stone, that old hard heart, and he wants to put a heart of flesh in, one that beats. Boom, 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 boom. That, that's our prayer for you. For some of you in here, you know what he's calling you to? Come back. He's calling you to examine why you do what you do. And he's saying, just come on home. Listen, you, if we return to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us. To cleanse us. Father, I love you and I'm thankful for this family. I'm thankful for the work that you're doing in my life. And I'm asking you, Father, to continue to do the work in their lives. As we work together to bring you glory, you honor, you fame. Father, this work is your work. It's not our work. Yet at the same point, you've called us to join you in it. And so, Father, I'm asking that today, as we sing to you, as we pray to you, as you give us opportunity around this altar, as you give us opportunity across the aisles, Father, would you draw, Holy Spirit, would you draw others in this room to salvation? I'm asking, Father, that you would um, open the eyes of your followers in here to recognize, to examine deep within Where's my heart? What am I looking for? What am, what's my motivation? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And then call us home. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are one who is long-suffering. You are steadfast in your love. And as your children, you welcome us home. It is your loving kindness that leads us to repentance. We magnify you today, Jesus, and we want to do whatever it is the Holy Spirit is asking us to do. May you have been magnified today. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things.